All right, so last time uh, we finished brachial plexus and cervical roots, and uh, this will be a bit shorter with a le little bit less detail, uh, but we'll do the similar kind of pattern here for evaluating the lumbosacral nerve roots and plexus. Um, so first of all, notice that when any anytime we're trying to figure out or localize radiculopathies or plexopathies, we want to look for three major categories of findings on the neuro exam, motor, sensory, and reflexes. All right, so you need to know muscles that are supplied in a certain root distribution um, or plexus distribution. Uh, you need to know the sensory pattern, uh, the dermatomal pattern, in other words, of the various roots and plexus. And then we need to know the reflexes uh, that can assess different parts of roots and plexus. All right, so we're not going to go through all the details of this, but I'll just make a few points here. First of all, L234 nerve roots continue on as the lumbar plexus, which is in this area here. All right, so I'm just going to go over three muscles that can evaluate both the L234 nerve roots and the lumbar plexus. Okay, and so we'll talk about uh, a muscle supplied by the obturator nerve, by the femoral nerve, and then a muscle here that comes right off of the lumbar plexus to uh, the iliacus or hip flexion. All right, so here are the three muscles here. And really, it's very difficult to distinguish an L234 uh, radiculopathy uh, versus a plexopathy. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to make that distinction for now. But these are the three muscles um, that we um, are going to learn for now. So first is hip flexion. So again, this comes off of the lumbar plexus and goes to the iliacus muscle, which is involved in flexion. So in this case, you just ask the patient to lift their knee up off the exam table and you provide counter pressure. Uh, quadriceps uh, over here is for knee extension. So we just ask the patient to straighten the leg out and you push down. So this is supplied by the femoral nerve. And again, if we just back up from the femoral nerve, this goes through the lumbar plexus and L234 nerve roots. And then finally, there are several muscles involved in adduction, where we just ask the patient to push their uh, feet or legs together, and we provide counter resistance. Um, and again, L234 nerve roots, lumbar plexus um, is involved in that. Okay. So again, we're just looking at this part of the roots and plexus anatomy, L234 lumbar plexus. Now we will come back to this nerve here called the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and this supplies the lateral portion of the thigh. And so this is a kind of a, mainly an L2 and a little bit of L3. Um, this is a, a lesion here is very common, which is I'm just bringing up this nerve for now. All right, now I would say from this whole handout, the questions that will most often be asked probably on boards are about S1 and L5 radiculopathies. So this would be really high yield that you know the muscles that are involved to evaluate uh, the S1 and L5 nerve roots. So notice the most significant contribution, at least that we can clinically evaluate of uh, the sacral plexus are L5 and S1. But we're going to sort these out and make a distinction here. Uh, S1 radiculopathies are extremely common, the most common radiculopathy of all, and L5 radiculopathies are also uh, quite common. So let's start with the L5 nerve root. So there are five muscles uh, for now uh, to put in this category. The first is hip abduction. Okay, so uh, you can do it with the patient lying on the table like this, but more practically, if we're just having a patient sit on the exam table, you just ask the patient to spread their knees apart and you provide counter resistance. So gluteus medius is hip abduction, and it is a very strong L5 muscle. We can also evaluate hamstrings right here. All right, so this is knee flexion. And hamstrings are L5 and S1. So this is one muscle here we'll, we'll kind of talk about having uh, two roots, L5 and S1. 
And then movement of the foot, either in dorsiflexion, eversion, or eversion, um, is a good way to assess L5. So dorsiflexion here of the foot, the muscle involved is tibialis anterior, dor dorsiflex the foot. Um, it's a strong L5 muscle. There's a little bit of an L4 contribution as well, but uh, much more L5 in this muscle. So again, that's tibialis anterior. Foot eversion is perineus longus, all right? And this is an L5 and an S1 muscle. And then over here, we see the patient inverting the foot. And so this is posterior tibialis. And this is an L5 muscle with some S1 contribution. Now, it turns out, I said L5 radiculopathies are very common. And the most common way that this presents is actually with this muscle here, tibialis anterior. So the most obvious presentation of an L5 radiculopathy is a foot drop. Okay, and so if you have a patient with a foot drop, then it becomes important to evaluate these other muscles, gluteus medius, hamstrings, inversion and eversion um, of the foot. All right, so again, here is our um, L5 S1 nerve roots. Here's the sacral plexus. And so if we follow this L5 nerve root here, and I'm gonna to try to get a little fancy here with this new highlighter, whoops. Now we can see that the superior gluteal nerve here supplies the gluteus medius. And so um, this is a very strong L5 muscle, whereas the inferior gluteal nerve that supplies gluteus maximus is predominantly an S1 muscle. All right, so uh, of course, we have L5 and S1 here contributing to the sciatic nerve, some S2 as well. And then um, two nerves we'll spend a lot more time talking about are the tibial nerve and the perineal nerve. Tibular nerve is now, um, we probably should call it the fibular nerve, but it's hard to, um, I'm sorry, the perineal nerve uh, now is called the fibular nerve, but it's kind of hard to get used to using that terminology. Most neurologists will still call this the perineal nerve. All right, so the muscles that supply the, the feet that we just talked about for dorsiflexion um, and for um, eversion are supplied by the perineal nerve. Uh, the tibial nerve supplies the posterior tibialis and that is for inversion of the foot. Okay, and then finally we come to the S1 nerve roots. Okay, and so three muscles to know for now, gastrocnemius, gluteus maximus, and the hamstrings. Hamstrings are already talked about because it's L5 and S1. All right, so again, here are the hamstrings, L5, S1. Gluteus maximus, if you have a patient lying on their stomach, you can ask them to elevate their leg. Um, more often, though, if the patient, uh, for example, is lying down on an exam table, you can just ask them to push their leg down into the bed and you try to lift it up. Uh, that's a perfectly fine way of uh, assessing uh, gluteus maximus. Okay, so remember, this is a good S1 muscle. Gastrocnemius, we can see the muscle here. You just ask the patient to plantar flex, push their foot down, okay, and that is S1. Okay, so those are the muscles. Um, and again, we'll add a lot more here as we, uh, once you get through anatomy and in the second year neuroscience course, but this is kind of a starting point. Now let's talk about the sensory uh, examination and the reflex examination. Okay, so the reflex examination is always really easy. You just find a muscle up here where we can assess a reflex. There's quadriceps. And so that is of course the patella reflex down here. So the patella reflex, um, very good way to assess L2, 3, 4 in the lumbar plexus. Notice that we do not have a good L5 reflex. Okay, we can't assess these muscles very well. We, we can do a hamstrings reflex, but that is difficult to do, All right? So we don't have a good way to assess L5 nerve roots via reflexes, but the Achilles reflex, and of course, um, it's the gastrocnemius muscle 
that is activated when you tap on the Achilles tendon. So we have a great reflex here to assess the S1 nerve roots. Okay, so you know about these already. Of course, we have the patellar reflex. Um, but again, if we're just going to follow this up, it's femoral nerve, lumbar plexus, L2, 3, 4 nerve roots. Achilles reflex here, when you tap on the Achilles tendon, you should get plantar flexion. So uh, gastrocnemius is supplied by the tibial nerve. And if we follow this up, it's sciatic nerve, and then sacral plexus, and then S1, 2 nerve roots. Now the sensory examination, um, again, there's a little variation if you look at different tables of this, but good rule of thumb that most of the thigh is L2, okay? M most of the knee area is L3, and L4 is the medial calf, okay? Now I think L5 uh, really extends here to the big toe. This one shows L4 going down to the big toe. So again, you're gonna get a little variation of uh, dermatomal maps, and there's, there's often a little overlap here from patient to patient. Okay, so L5, is the lateral leg area and down to the lateral shin, the dorsum of the foot. And S1 is most of the posterior leg and the plantar surface of the foot. Okay, so here's another map that um, I like, dermatomal map showing you L2 is mainly the thigh. L3 is around the knee area. Um, L4, remember, goes down to the medial calf. Okay, and then here, I think probably more accurate, L5 is the lateral shin area and onto the dorsum of the foot here down to the uh, first and second toes. S1 is the lateral foot and the plantar surface of the foot and up the back of the leg. All right, so remember lumbar plexus is L2, 3, 4. And so the lumbar plexus distribution is really just including all three of these nerve roots. So it's thigh, knee, medial calf. Uh, the sacral plexus here then would include the L5 and S1 nerve roots up the back of the leg. So lumbosacral radiculopathy is really the same um, as cervical radiculopathies in the sense that these patients uh, have back pain with an electrical radiating sensation down the leg. Okay, just like cervical radiculopathies. Again, frequently the sensory pattern that the patient complains of will tell you um, which root is involved. So if the patient has back pain with shooting pain and numbness down to the medial thigh, you should be thinking L4. Okay, and then of course we can assess this further by checking reflexes and strength um, testing. All right, so I said S1 radiculopathies are most common, very common on boards. All right, so you look for weakness in these muscles. So it's back pain, shooting pain down the back of the leg, a loss of Achilles reflex, loss of sensation in the posterior leg and foot. Um, just one point that is often confusing, um, patients use the term sciatica to describe shooting pain down the back of the leg. Many physicians use that term. Um, sciatic nerve lesions are exceedingly rare. Um, I've seen a few cases in 20 years as a neurologist. Um, so if the term sciatica is thrown around, just realize that that is most likely describing an S1 radiculopathy, not a sciatic nerve lesion. All right, L5 radiculopathies, uh, very, very common. Uh, remember that foot drop here from involvement of tibialis anterior is usually the most obvious complaint the patient has. So they have a floppy foot. They have to lift their leg up higher because this muscle is weak. So you want to then confirm this by checking these other muscles. Okay. They should have sensory loss in the lateral leg, shin, dorsum of the foot. But remember, even though this is a lower motor neuron problem, um, we don't have a good reflex to assess the L5 nerve roots. So reflexes in terms of Achilles and patellar will be normal. Your leg reflexes, uh, the normal ones you check are normal. All right, caudiquina syndrome. Um, 
Remember the spinal cord ends at about L1 vertebral body level. And from there, we have all of these nerve roots that are going down into the legs that travel together um, until they exit the neural foramen as caught equina. They're all kind of lumped together there. So if we have a big disc herniation or some other mass um, below the termination of the cord, um, we can involve multiple nerve roots. So caudic equina syndrome results in bilateral lumbosacral radiculopathies. So we have shooting pain down both legs, some weakness in both legs. Because so many nerve roots are involved, and in particular, um, if our sacral nerve roots are involved, there will be some bowel and bladder dysfunction and also some sexual dysfunction. Okay, and one kind of classic thing about caudic equina syndrome is if we involve these S3 to 5 uh, nerve roots, then we have a loss of sensation in this area. And this is called a saddle anesthesia. So this kind of a sensory loss pattern is uh, rather typical for cauda equina syndrome. Now, sometimes you're asked to distinguish cauda equina syndrome from a lesion at the tip of the spinal cord. Okay, and the tip of the spinal cord is called the conus medullaris. So what is the difference? Well, one thing is, you know, this is the spinal cord. The spinal cord contains upper motor neuron pathways. So conus medullaris lesion uh, will look for some upper motor neuron findings, maybe a Babinski sign, maybe a patella reflex that is a little brisk, maybe some clonus. Okay, the cauda equina, uh, these are nerve roots. Nerve roots are lower motor neurons. So we're only allowed to have lower motor neuron findings in cauda equina syndrome. So loss of reflexes, um, atrophy, floppy flaccid tone. We might get some upper motor neuron findings with the conus lesion. Conus lesions uh, tend to involve mainly the, the sacral part of the cord. So we're not going to get so much of, for example, the L2, 3, 4, 5 uh, distribution weakness. Radiculopathies, remember, a hallmark of radiculopathies is they're extremely painful. We get radicular shooting pain. So a lesion of the conus tends to be less painful. Also, lesions in the spinal cord uh, tend to produce fairly symmetrical findings. All right, so um, equal symptoms in both legs. Radiculopathies, if you're going to pick off radiculopathies in both legs from cauda equina syndrome, tends to be asymmetrical. Okay. And I mentioned cauda equina syndrome, you get bowel and bladder involvement. Well, that's even more common and worse when the spinal cord is involved. Okay. In the second year class, when we talk about um, spinal cord disorders, we will say these patients virtually always have significant bowel and bladder dysfunction. But this can be difficult to um, sort out between these two. All right, I'm just gonna give you one example to know for now in terms of a lumbosacral flexopathy, and this is retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which uh, almost exclusively involves the lumbar plexus. So there are other things. You know, we can have cancer or radiation injury, or sometimes uh, an iatrogenic um, injury from uh, injection into the buttocks in a wrong location, but uh, Let's just worry about one for now, retroperitoneal hemorrhage. All right, so here is our lumbar plexus, L2, 3, 4 nerve roots coming together to form the lumbar plexus. And what can happen in patients who are on blood thinners, usually in the hospital, so maybe the patients come in for a myocardial infarction, they're on a blood thinner, um, is that we can get a spontaneous hemorrhage into the retroperitoneal area. Now, the lumbar plexus is formed right in the psoas muscle, in the retroperitoneum, and blood tends to settle down um, in this area when we have a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And so patients develop then uh, weakness in a femoral nerve distribution. Remember, that's quadriceps, obturator nerve, so your adductor muscles to push your knees together. Um, and then we mentioned the nerve to iliacus here for hip flexion. So the patient's gonna have weakness of those muscles. They'll have sensory loss in L2, 3, 4. So remember that's thigh, here's the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. 
um, for the lateral thigh and down to the knee, the medial calf is L4. And then of course, they're going to lose the patellar reflex because that is quadriceps here supplied by the uh, femoral nerve. All right, so these are emergencies when patients have this. And usually if you just stop the blood thinner, things clear up uh, pretty well. Here's the sensory distribution down here of the lumbar plexopathy down to the medial calf in the thigh and the knee area. And again, we lose the patellar reflex. Okay, just one more. This is really not a plexopathy or a radiculopathy, um, but it's so common. I just have to use this excuse here to talk about this. So we mentioned the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which comes off uh, here from L2, three nerve roots, supplies the lateral thigh. Okay, this is a pure sensory nerve. It doesn't supply any muscles. Okay, but it travels through the lateral groin area. And so it is frequently compressed in patients who are overweight and who wear tight belts. And so patients come in with this burning pain in the lateral thigh with numbness. Um, I've seen several patients with this who were police officers or worked for Southern California Edison, and they've got the big belts that are tight, uh, cinched up tight, and they compress the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. I've seen uh, young, healthy individuals that just wear tight pants, they get this. All right, so they have lateral thigh numbness, and so you can take out your safety pin, and, you know, the patient will say, yeah, I don't feel much when you tap them there. But because it doesn't supply any muscles, there's no weakness and no reflex changes. Okay, but this is very common. I think most of you will see this, a patient or two during medical school, or certainly if you go into family practice, internal medicine. Um, and so the main thing is don't wear tight fitting pants um, or belts. So wear sweats for a while and uh, hopefully things will improve. All right, so I just wanna um, here in finishing up this lecture, uh, show you a little video of a patient um, who has a, an L234 radiculopathy. Okay, and um, I've posted this on Canvas, but uh, I'm just gonna show the examination. Um, his cause is actually not from a disc herniation. He has diabetes, and in uh, some patients with diabetes, you can have ischemia of the L234 nerve roots, and that's the particular cause in his case. I wanna just show a few things here on the exam. Uh, let me first in this leg, just have you lift the knee up and push up against my hand. Iliacus looks normal. Normal, and then push up over here. And there's some weakness there. Okay, and good effort. I'm going to have you push the knees apart, so oblivious medius appears normal. And push your knees together now. Try to hold them there tightly. And I can pull apart. Thigh adduction is just slightly weak um, here in the right leg. Now let me have you straighten this leg out all the way, and just push up against my hand. Here. I'm being kind of gentle because you got some pain, <laughs> some cramps there last time yes. we did this. Okay, now let your legs relax. There was just some slight diminished pain and temperature sensation, mm -hmm. really an anterior medial and lateral thigh on this side, which I won't show, normal below the knee. And now we'll just check some reflexes. And a quite brisk left patellar, I would say about three plus. So clearly there is reflex asymmetry here. All right, so that's just a, a nice um, kind of confirmation um, here. Of course, the reflex examination, um, a good objective finding. And um, so in this context, fits really well in his case with uh, radiculopathy involving the L234 nerve roots.